Hey YouTube, I'm Ali, welcome to the channel. Now, if I asked you all to tell me about the last board game you played without actually naming it, the probability is you would each use a different method to describe that board game back to me. And that's understandable because out there on the internet, there doesn't seem to be a single way of categorizing all the different board game genres. In this video, I've taken on the impossible task of trying to fix that. I've come up with my own bit of research and my own way of categorizing those board games into things that I think make sense. I hope you find this video entertaining and informational. Informational. Informative, that's the word I'm looking for. Um, and if you do, I hope you give it a thumbs up. If you like this kind of content, let me know and perhaps subscribe to the channel because, quite frankly, every sub helps. Okay, so a quick bit about how I actually approached this task. What I did is I went out onto the internet. I went to places like Board Game Geek, Reddit, Board Game Atlas, a ton of really, really useful and thorough um, board game websites, um, some of which I'll list in the description below. Um, and I gathered all the terms that were being used to describe board game genres. I then took them down and then started categorizing them myself, grouping them together into things that made sense. Now, a quick word here about what I didn't include in that list. I didn't include any role-playing or war games because I don't regard those as board games. They are tabletop games, but they're not board games. So they've been excluded. What follows then is my list broken down into categories. And I'm going to start with what I've called accessibility. So the first three terms I came across were hobby, mainstream, and classic. Uh, and these form the bedrock of my board game genre list. Uh, I think these are mutually exclusive in that you can't have a hobby game that's also a classic game. But you could, for example, have movement in between them. A hobby game can become mainstream as it becomes more popular. So to give you an example of exactly what I mean by classic, um, I'm thinking of games like chess, drafts, checkers, uh, maybe shoots and ladders or snakes and ladders if you're in the UK. These are games that I think can be produced without license, that anyone can produce and brand, and they are generally found in their millions through any kind of shop. Even supermarkets will sell these kinds of games. Now, for mainstream, these are games that are generally produced in large numbers. Uh, they're produced usually by toy manufacturers or large organizations um, like Hasbro or Milton Bradley, for example. Um, you tend to find them uh, purchased, yes, in supermarkets, because you can buy everything in supermarkets nowadays, but also bookshops. Um, they, and of course, Amazon. Um, they tend to have large print runs. They're, they're quite colorful, they're thematic. They're usually aimed to be played by a family of four, is what I found. So those are mainstream games. Um, examples of mainstream games are things like Monopoly, of course, or Trivial Pursuits, Mousetrap. Nowadays, as I've mentioned, a few board games from the hobby world have come over as well. So games like Cards Against Humanity or even uh, Settlers of Catan, I think would, would be classed as mainstream now. And the final genre of uh, board game that I think is, is really my bedrock, I've used that twice now, is the hobby world. Now, hobby board games um, are really what this channel is all about. And you and me as budding game designers are probably going to aim to build games in that world. Um, hobby board games range from a whole different type uh, of, uh, of, of play style and uh, mechanic, and we'll come on to those in just a minute. Um, but examples are things like uh, Castles of Burgundy, Burgundy, Forbidden uh, Island, um, I mean there's just thousands of them for crying out loud. Now I'm also going to call out components as a way of describing the different genres. Um, some people describe their game as a board game because it had a focus on using a board. Others would talk about a card game because, well, there was no board, it was just cards. And the third variation of this genre I found was um, tile. Um, so games that were played with tiles. Mahjong being a, a good example of a classic 
board game that uses tiles. Now, these aren't necessarily mutually exclusive. Lots of board games use cards, um, but are called board games. Monopoly is an example. Lots of card games also um, use a board, but are called card games because the board doesn't really uh, play a significant part. Um, just trying to think of an example, and I can't, but there we go. Uh, tile laying games tend to be very easy to identify because they're predominantly based around laying tiles. By far the most common uh, method of uh, board game genre classification that I found was in using the mechanic, the predominant mechanic that that board game used. I found, for example, lots of references to roll and move games, or area control games, or deck building games, or traitor games, or um, worker placement games, um, or legacy games. These are all mechanics that make up how the game works, and they were being used as genres. The ones I've listed there, I think, are the most common ones, um, so I'm going to focus on those, but I'm not going to list all of them, because quite frankly, um, there are hundreds, 275, I think, was my last count. Um, if you want a full list, I'll put a link to the list of mechanics that Board Game Geek suggests exist. Again, not all of these are being used to describe a genre of board game, but the ones I've mentioned in this video are, uh, and there may be a few extra ones in there that I've missed. Theme was also used often as a way of breaking board games down into different genres. Games were described as being thematic or abstract. Now, abstract is pretty self-explanatory. They don't have an on, uh, underlying theme. A good example would be something like checkers or drafts uh, in a classic board game sense. These don't have, those tokens don't represent anything. Um, more modern examples, I mean you could call Azul for example a, um, an abstract game, although it is supposed to be a tile layer decking out a palace in a, uh, in a royal sort of Portuguese um, palace. Y that isn't really coming across, it's an abstract game. Now the Converse of this are games that are described as being thematic. Lots of games have theme, um, Azul for example, but they're not described as thematic. A game like um, Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective, however, that is all about feeling like a detective and hunting down your criminal. Those games are described as thematic. Now, I found this very shaky uh, in terms of a description. I, I couldn't really qualify what was regarded as thematic and what wasn't on paper. It's very much an interpretation of what people generally think. Uh, so just be warned on that. Now, the other common way of describing um, different board game genres was what I would call the overall play style. Um, the two obvious ones here that I'm going to call out are Euro games and Ameritrash. But I'm also going to stick in uh, party games here and family games. So Euro games are games that come from Europe, obviously, uh, usually Germany, in fact. Um, they are heavily focused on strategy. The conflict is usually indirect um, and they can be quite abstract. Uh, they're not always very thematic, though there are plenty of examples uh, which um, belie that rule. Um, Power Grid, I think, is a good example of a Euro game um, that, that follows that kind of sense. Now, conversely, you've got the unfortunately named Ameritrash games. Now, Ameritrash games tend to be brightly coloured, very simplistic, uh, lots of combat and conflict, direct conflict, uh, and usually very heavily themed. Um, King of Tokyo is an example that I would give here uh, of an Ameritrash kind of game. Family games tend to be uh, very simplistic, very similar to Ameritrash, but the conflict isn't always direct. Here, the, the rules are quite uh, straightforward. It's usually very highly themed, usually found in the mainstream world. Uh, family games, uh, an example of a good family game would be Settlers of Catan, I think, um, or Ticket to Ride. Uh, these are games that are similar to those kind of Monopoly-esque kind of games of roll and move kind of games um, that you may be familiar with, well, I'm sure you're familiar with, um, but a family game generally isn't as combative 
Is that a word? Yes. As a, a merry trash game, I think. Uh, they're more focused to around four players and, like I said, quite light and fun. Now, the definition of light and fun, though, really falls into the final category in this world, and uh, that's party games. Uh, party games are games that um, really in, in, uh, inhabit the spirit of a party. You don't turn up to a party with a big board game, but you might turn up with just a few cards. And that's one of the key things of a, a party game. They're usually very light in components, they're very quick to play and to pick up, uh, and they're usually a lot of fun. The element here is uh, of having a good time, uh, and usually there's a lot of social interaction with a party game, uh, which may not be present in, say, the uh, Euro-style games that I mentioned earlier. My final container or bucket of genres uh, I'm going to class as usage. Um, now, uh, these terms here, again, I found widely used on the internet, uh, the first of which is educational. Um, now, most games, of course, the usage of the game will be for entertainment purposes, but there is a subset of games uh, that are being created or have been created really for an educational purpose. A lot of religious games are going to be educational games. Um, a good example of a non-religious educational game would be something like Cashflow 101, uh, a game by Robert Kiyosaki. That game really focuses on teaching kids how to to use money, uh, well, not just kids, adults as well, how to use money. Um, these kind of games, again, they usually roll and move kind of games. They're not very strategic, uh, but they're focusing on an educational purpose. Now, another very common another another very common term is filler uh, game. Now, a filler game is a short game uh, that fills the space between people arriving at your house to play a board game and the main event of the board game. Um, and usually, they uh, occupy these kind of games are meant for lots of different uh, people. So you'll have high numbers of players in there. Um, they're very simplistic. Uh, they're very quick. Um, because they're literally just filling in a gap that could be closed any moment. Uh, so if you have Fred and Barbara, I don't know who Fred and Barbara are, turning up to your house a little earlier than everyone else, well, a, you can crack out a filler game, uh, break the ice and, and get them playing. Filler games also, like party games in fact, can be used uh, to break the ice, I think, and to introduce people um, to uh, board games in general. And that leads me to the final genre, nice segue there, Ali, uh, of um, gateway games. Now, gateway games are games, uh, is a term given to games that um, are almost akin to Monopoly. Uh, so there's a set of rules, it's kind of that roll and move dynamic, but there's a little bit of a twist. Usually it's not roll and move. Um, a good gateway game uh, example would be something like Ticket to Ride or um, Splendor. These games aren't very complex. Uh, they are bordering on being mainstream, um, but they are geared towards introducing you as a new player to some of more complex mechanics that you'll find in more um, Euro style games, for example. Right, well then, I don't know how I did with that. Uh, that was my attempt at trying to categorize um, board game genres. I hope I did okay. I'm sure you'll let me know if I didn't in the comments below. Guys, I do this because I'm genuinely interested in understanding how games work, uh, the design methodology behind them, all in an attempt to try to produce my own games. I've made a few videos now about game design, I've interviewed people around their ideas, and if you really want to catch up and be aware of what's coming next, the best way of doing that is subscribing to the channel. I hope that you found this video useful. If you did, give it a thumbs up, like I said, but for now and until next time, take care.